I'm John Godfrey, Chair of the Wallenberg Committee of the University of Michigan, and I am pleased to welcome you to the 23rd presentation of the Wallenberg Medal. We are honored to be joined this evening by President Mark Schlissel and by Catherine White, Chair of the University of Michigan's Board of Regents, and by Regent Julia Darlow. In W.G. Sebald's luminous and haunted novel, Austerlitz, a historian of architecture, who in 1939, as a young Jewish child, was sent on the kinder transport from Prague to Wales to be raised by a Calvinist preacher and his wife, the historian roams Europe for 30 years to reconstruct his lost memory and identity, uncovering fragments from places, objects, buildings, images, and stories that he collects, assembles, interrogates, reassembles, and narrates to discern uncertain shadows of an obliterated past. Siebold's narrator, whose elliptical journeys pursue the faint and nearly forgotten traces of the fates of his parents and others who disappeared in the little fortress at Theresen and other places fading and faded from memory, observes how the darkness does not lift but becomes yet heavier as I think how little we can hold in mind how everything is constant, constantly lapsing into oblivion with every extinguished life how the world is, as it were, draining itself, and that the history of countless places and objects which themselves have no power of memory is never heard, never described, or passed on. Siebold's architectural historian acknowledges the trauma of resurfacing the past, recognizing how little practice I had in using my memory, and conversely, how hard I must always have tried to recollect as little as possible, avoiding everything which is related to my unknown past. In January 1944, Nina Wallenberg accompanied her new husband, Gunnar Lagergren, to wartime Berlin, where he took up his position as the first secretary of the embassy which neutral Sweden maintained in the 17th century Kaputh Palace, located some distance from the German capital so as to be less likely to fall victim to the regular raids by Allied bombers. On July 7, 1944, not 10 years after his graduation as an architecture student from the University of Michigan, Raoul Wallenberg flew from Stockholm to Berlin, where he reunited with his sister Nina and Gunnar. Nina was pregnant with their first child. Two days later, Raoul traveled by train to Vienna and on to Budapest with a mission to rescue as many of Budapest Jews as possible from the death marches and deportations to Auschwitz that Adolf Eichmann was organizing. Several weeks later, when the Allied bombing around Berlin intensified, Gunnar drove Nina to Stockholm so she could be with her parents in safety and then he returned to his post in Berlin. Seventy years ago, on this October 14th, Nina Lagergren gave birth to a daughter, Nan. Nina and Raoul's brother, Guy, an engineering student, took a photo of the new mother and child and developed it in his laboratory at the Royal Technical University. He then hastened to the Stockholm airport where a friend who was a pilot was about to fly to Berlin. Despite the intensity of the war, the photo miraculously reached Gunnar on the same day as the birth of his daughter. Gunnar promptly used the embassy telephone, calling his brother-in-law at the Swedish legation in Budapest to tell Raoul the good news, that he was an uncle for the first time. This joyful conversation was the last time that Raoul's family heard his voice. Within days, the advancing Soviet army encircled Budapest beginning a siege that lasted until February 11th, 1945. Wallenberg and many tens of thousands of Jews he sought to protect found themselves confined within a murderous circle along the banks of the Danube. The killing in Budapest intensified. The river drained from the city the bodies of many victims. It was here where, working with others, Raoul Wallenberg stood his ground defending the lives of those who were defenseless 
against the deadly ambitions of the Nazi SS and the Hungarian fascist militia. Nina, Gunnar, and Guy never allowed the memory of Raoul Wallenberg to be drained from the world. They relentlessly pursued the governments of Sweden, the Soviet Union, and Russia to learn his fate. The truth remains unknown, but they have succeeded in their lifelong struggle to rescue Raoul and the lives of others with him, those who died and those who survived, from lapsing into oblivion. What we, as members of Raoul Wallenberg's university, hold in mind together through the power of our collective memory is strong and lasting. Tonight, we lift the darkness in remembrance of the conviction and courage of Wallenberg. We keep his spirit and voice alive in this, his university, which he loved and which, with his open, eager, and engaged architect's eye, he knew intimately. To introduce our medalist this evening, I'm honored to present Mark Schlissel, the 14th president of the University of Michigan. Good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you, Dr. Godfrey, uh, for the introduction and for chairing the Wallenberg uh, Award uh, Committee. Uh, friends, colleagues, students, staff, and members of the Michigan community, it's an honor to be here to present the 23rd Wallenberg Medal to tonight's distinguished honoree, Agnes Heller. I want to thank the members of the Wallenberg Committee and all those who've established and now carry forward the proud Wallenberg legacy at the University of Michigan. Raoul Wallenberg was one of the first alumni I learned about when I accepted my new job. And I was pleased to be able to announce his Congressional Gold Medal at our Board of Regents meeting in July. As a relative newcomer to the campus, I've been spending a lot of time getting to know the university, its history, its people, and its traditions. What I've learned is that traditions have meaning here that few other universities can boast. And those traditions uphold the very highest values of excellence and of impact. Now, I was trained as a bioscientist, and as a result, I always try to measure everything. Traditions are no exception. But like so much of what we do here, our traditions have scale and weight that is in a class by itself. At the University of Michigan, traditions are measured in big, powerful terms, like lives saved, generations inspired, and understanding increased across the full breadth of humanity. They include a deep commitment to improving our world, and in this case, they are represented in full measure by our heroic alumnus, Raoul Wallenberg. His courage and his legacy bring into sharp focus how one person can make a tremendous impact on the lives of so many. The Wallenberg Medal is one of Michigan's finest traditions, and since 1990, it's become another example of the excellence of this university. This year's awardee is a very fitting of both the tradition and the excellence of the University of Michigan. Agnes Heller is a world-renowned academic, author, and advocate for the oppressed, winning numerous awards for her scholarship in philosophy and spending decades as a relentless defender of human rights, efforts that continue to this day. She and her mother narrowly escaped being sent to Auschwitz, the Nazi concentration camp that would take the life of her father. Living through the darkness of the Holocaust has greatly influenced Dr. Heller's body of work. She has said that her first inquiry was to explore the sources of morality and evil. The beginnings of that exploration led to a lifetime as a scholar with research over a broad spectrum of philosophy and political thought. Her previous honors include the University of Copenhagen Sonning Prize and the Goethe Medal, an official decoration of the Federal Republic of Germany. She's also a member of the Hungarian Academy of Sciences. Throughout her life, Dr. Heller has never wavered from her commitment to opposing totalitarianism, fiercely criticizing those who abuse power, and demanding that all voices be heard. This has led to numerous personal and professional consequences. 
Following the 1956 revolution in Hungary, the Soviet-backed government barred her from working in the academy, and she taught grammar school for a few years. Lucky students. She left Hungary in exile in 1977 because of persecution for her dissent against the ruling party. But she always persevered in her scholarship and in her defense of the oppressed. Dr. Heller later served as a, philosophy, a professor of philosophy and department chair at the New School for Social Research, eventually becoming the Hannah Arendt Visiting Professor of Philosophy and Political Science at the New York campus. More recently, she has spoken out about the Hungarian government's systematic methods of exercising control over universities. I said in my inaugural address that we must celebrate excellence at the University of Michigan. This medal, along with the fellowship we created to carry forward the Wallenberg legacy and the opportunity to hear from the world's preeminent individuals are all great causes for celebration. Now I ask you to please help me celebrate the 2014 Wallenberg medalist, Dr. Agnes Heller. Dr. Heller, please join me. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to introduce the moderator for tonight's conversation. Uh, Scott Spector is a professor of Germanic languages and literatures, history, and Judaic studies. His primary scholarly focus is the cultural history of modern Central Europe. And like me, he earned his PhD from Johns Hopkins University. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Scott Spector. Thank you. Um, thank you all for coming. And thank you, Agnes Heller, for accepting the award and for coming here to talk to us today. Thanks for the Wallenberg Committee, for the new president, for John Godfrey and the others to give me this award. Thank you very much, and thank for you to be present at the occasion. We've been talking since this afternoon and this evening about your life and, and your work. And your last book is on autobiographical uh, memory. And it is apt because we did think that today it would be a good idea to connect your work to your life or to ask you to talk about what the relationship is of your life to your work. Um, you said, for instance, that your experience in the Holocaust has influenced all of your philosophical work and also your thinking about engagement, civic engagement, the connection between thinking and life. I wonder if you could just extrapolate on that for us today. You mentioned my new book about autobiographical memory. Mm -hmm. And autobiographical memory, which every one of us, of you have, we have memory flashes, and we have no continuous memories, but we somehow get, bring together these memory flashes and tell ourselves different kinds of stories. So I also tell different kinds of stories of my life. Mm -hmm. I wrote a little book about short history of my philosophy. It was one history you can write and talk about many, many histories of your life. Mm -hmm. So since I received now this Wallenberg medal, I have to start my autobiography memory <laughs> with my memory of Wallenberg. Yeah. I would never do it, but <laughs> in these conditions, I do start my autobiographical story with Wallenberg, because I was in Budapest uh, during the Holocaust. I was in a, an international ghetto, although I was not in a Swedish house, which were protected by Wallenberg, but in a Swiss house, which was protected by the Swiss ambassador Lutz. 
but we all knew about Wallenberg. Wallenberg was a name for us, we always mentioned, it was in our dreams. He was a hero, a kind of angel, who brought back one of my cousins from the border of Austria, because went to the border of Austria and picked up the people who were, their Jews were, brought them back to the Swedish houses. He was a heroic figure, so he played a very important role in my memory when I was 15 years of age. Even later on, after the liberation, we knew that he disappeared. That's what we knew, he has disappeared. We had no idea where he went, what happened to him. So we surmised that since the German army was, was shooting Budapest streets from Buddha, yeah, that maybe he was shot by them and he was killed and he was not recognized by anyone and just put with all other corpses together in the Danube or somewhere in a common grave. Only very much later on did we realize that he was taken by the Soviet army, the Soviet Union, that he was imprisoned. And we do not know even now, we will never perhaps know how he really died. So this memory is important in my autobiographical memory. But you ask another question, who asks the combination, that is the relationship of my philosophy to my personal experiences. You see, Hegel said once upon a time, all philosophers who are in the audience know that, that philosophy is nothing else but the expression of our own times in concepts. So my philosophy is also nothing else than expression of our times in concepts. However, so many people live in the same time. And I was not the only philosopher who survived the Holocaust. There were few of us. But all of them have a different autobiography. Because a single person experiences the time in his or her own way, the same time. And there's a lot of similarities in our philosophy, but they are different because different personalities. So, to put another philosopher, and it's very fitting to your question, Nietzsche said, philosophy is nothing else but autobiography. So it's also my philosophy. So when you ask about the relationship of my experiences, that I, I was basically, I got the death penalty when I was 14 years of age. I, the question was only when it, when it will be executed. It was only question, not that I will be killed, that was certain, but when they execute, the, this, this I did not know. So uh, this experience, which was a, basically a terrible trauma, a trauma cannot be forgotten. It, um, it has its, uh, its um, I think, its tent in the whole life or during your whole life. We will not forget it, even if you want to forget it. The more you want to forget it, the less you can forget it. But if I speak about philosophy, I wanted to work out this trauma also in philosophy. This trauma and the other one, the, when the, the betrayal of our hopes, that in 1945 we, we cherished hopes in freedom. It was liberation, but not every liberation it becomes freedom. For freedom, it's not only enough to be liberated, we have to constitute our liberties, but it hasn't happened. After liberation came the Soviet occupation. So I had to work out these two experiences. The experience of Nazi totalitarianism and of course the uh, Auschwitz, uh, I would say Holocaust experience. And the other experience, the betrayal of hopes that liberation was not followed by constitutional liberties, but with other kinds of slavery. And when I started to write about ethics and philosophy of history, these two experiences led my pen or my computer or whatever. It was a typewriter at that time. So anyway, I wanted to find out how people are able to do this kind of things. How can it happen that people, normal people, are not absolutely evil people, normal people can throw children into gas chambers and kill babies. That was the Nazi question, which I could never, re never answer. But that made for me important to discuss the problems of ethics. What does it mean to murder? What is evil? Is there such a thing as radical evil? And on the other hand, the Soviet experience made me ask the question, how are totalitarian societies possible. 
how is totalitarianism possible? What is in modernity, in the modern world, which makes total control possible? <coughs> so these two experiences made me <coughs> possible and basically inspired me <coughs> to speak about ethics and write about ethics, write about philosophy of history. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. I mean, your life is also, in your life, you've also modeled um, civic engagement by a scholar intellectual in ways that I think have inspired a lot of people and that we'd like to hear more about. But in particular, I thought I'd ask you, how is it that this, this role as a civically engaged scholar intellectual has, ha, has it been the same role, in fact, as you move through different regimes in Hungary, then Australia, the United States, and then Hungary again? Or has the role itself changed? How has your view toward the engagement of ideas with society there is, changed? That's a different kind of things. First of all, you engage in writing philosophy. Uh, uh, your own time is expressed in your philosophical writings. This is an engagement, but it is indirectly a civil engagement. It is engagement of thinking, asking questions, try to understand, try to interpret the world and find out what good life is all about. But there, is, there is such a thing as good life. What a good life is all about, is it all about? And of course, in the ethics, I have to start the question, how can I understand modern ethics? Because we have no foundation, the moral world has no foundation, but we can, I can express in the following way, freedom is the foundation of the modern world, with the contrast to the pre-modern world, but freedom is a foundation which does not found. How can you live in a world morally, where, which is founded by something like freedom, which in fact does not found? Because it, can it doesn't be have a ground. No, really. because it can be interpreted a thousand different ways. Mm -hmm. So that's why it's not a, it's a foundation which is not a real foundation. Like, of course, when God was the foundation, he did found. Yeah? Mm -hmm. We knew that the world was created by God. We knew the Ten Commandments and all the other commandments. We knew that we have to obey the priest, the rabbi, I don't know what, gives us the good advices. There was a foundation. No foundation whatsoever. Freedom does not form. Now, how can you have a moral philosophy in a world in which there is no foundation? So I started, of course, with Kant, who gave us a, a very good solution and answer to this question, but this answer we cannot accept because the answer <laughs> went with a metaphysical kind of thinking, and we do not, uh, but you see, uh, nowadays we cannot think metaphysically anymore. That also has some relationship to our world. Our world uh, it cannot be thought in metaphysical concepts. We cannot understand our world in metaphysical concepts, so you have to give a different answer to this question. I don't want to tell you what an I answer I gave because that would take too much time. But this, this is an issue I had to... The other issue was history. What does it mean? What is, what, can we have a philosophy history? Can we have a grand narrative as it is called now? Is there progress in history? So in the 19th century, we spoke always about progressive history. Can you speak after Auschwitz and the Gulag about universal progress? It, 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 is, it would be abnormal. Yeah, <laughs> to speak. But what can you say? 20th century, but universal progress with Auschwitz and the Gulag, you cannot really believe it anymore. How can you understand history then? How can mm -hmm. you understand? Is there a historical law? Are there historical laws? Is everything contingent in history? Mm -hmm. Now, these are the questions we have to address, and this is also a philosophical question. Of course, all these philosophical questions, because they express our times in concepts, has a relationship to what you mentioned as public concern. Because when you speak about public concerns, public concerns, if they are about thinking, if thinking, not obedience, is the most important thing, you have to interpret, think over what our tasks, our duties, our possibilities in our world are, it, to this, it belongs the reception of certain kind of philosophy. So philosophy had different kind of receptions. A scientific reception, sociologists receive uh, philosophy in this way, or you can have historians also. You can have a personal, subjective 
uh, reception. I want to get an answer to the meaning of my own life. And you can have a political reception. Mm -hmm. That is, we find out how, how we can understand the public issues of our day, and we get inspiration from a philosophy to understand this issue. So philosophy as received, received from a political position, is very much a public issue. And everyone who is seriously concerned with public issues somehow is really at some kind of philosophy, because it's thinking, and you need to think it over. Uh, as Kant said, I'm sorry to quote always philosophers, uh, that, that it's a vulnerable thing, but he said that there's three things in public sphere you need to learn. Think with your own mind, can think from the position of another person, of another position, and think consistently. And if you do these three things, that's a good. That's good, then you're a good citizen. Then you can contribute at least to the, uh, addressing the problems of your age. I would not say solution, because life is not a problem which can be solved. Yeah? Uh, you are sure about this. And so, uh, politics is not a problem which can be solved. I hope, hope we are a solution. We, we have a paradise on earth. That's a wrong uh, answer to the question, a wrong question to the answer, because it is considered that there is such a thing as absolute truth, and we find the absolute truth, the absolute good model of the world, of societies, everything. Hip hop will turn good, and the paradise will be on earth, and that will not be, and will never be. So I think we need to interpret and reinterpret it with our thought, thinkingly, the concrete issues of our world. And the activity, the action, is based on this interpretation. It is not blind action. It's not just an action, of course. Emotions play always a sort of very important role in political action and every participation. That is, you need a passion, you need enthusiasm, you need uh, something which is emotional. But you have to think it over what you are doing first. Because if you don't think it over what you're doing first, and you don't ask questions, why are you doing that in politics? Mm -hmm. What you're doing? You can very easily um, participate in a kind of totalitarian procedure. Because mm -hmm. they all wanted to, you to think politically, demonstrate, organize demonstrations. They, of course, Nazis, communists, fascists organized great demonstrations. People were shouting there, were crying there, and they were participating in political action. But they were not stopping, not thinking for a moment what they are doing, why they are doing it. But that's right to do it. So that's why it's important to think not only with our own mind, but our own mind not the um, mind of the crowd, and the, also from the standpoint of the other. And consistently, in order to look critically, uh, not, upon, not only upon what the others are thinking, but look critically about on our own com commitments too, because only this way can one become a decent citizen. Of course, citizen can be only if there is a democracy, at least a liberal democracy, because you can be a citizen only if there, there is a city, symbolically speaking. So you, as a subject, cannot be a good citizen because a subject, subject must obey and has no rights whatsoever. Mm -hmm. You spoke about rights that, that I was always, uh, in a way, and, uh, acting in order to establish certain kind of rights in my country, but it was a different thing when in a totalitarian situation where you could not write anything about politics, you could not talk politically, you had to do it in other ways. Mm -hmm. And there were times when mere decency is a political act. Mm -hmm. And you know, when you read Brecht's Galilei, it's a very mm -hmm. beautiful play, and it, uh, when Brecht says, when I think that Brecht's scholar, a student, is saying it when I remember that unhappy are the times which have no heroes. Mm -hmm. And Galilei answers, unhappy are the times which need heroes. Mm -hmm. I think we lived, I lived mainly on the unhappy times which needed heroes. Mm -hmm. And I think it's better to live in a time where the that there is no need for heroes. Now, they need that heroes because even becoming, remaining a moral person 
was a kind of heroism. In a totalitarian country, in Nazism, or in this kind of countries, to be decent, remaining decent, is a heroic action. But if there is a possibility for action, for example, civic action, that's another matter. Then, then it's participation in, I think philosophers always love to participate in politics, I mentioned this, but there are two kinds of philosophers. One from Plato to Sartre who wanted to persuade uh, dictators and kings and, and tsars, etc., and they should be enlightened. They should do the right thing because they, the philosophers, they know it best. But what, uh, what they should do, so the tyrants will should do. That even they draw in uh, the best of um, the men of enlightenment visit the Tsar in Katarina to persuade her what, what she should do in order to make his people happy. And Immanuel can said, no, no one can make a people happy against the will of the people themselves. And then Hegel answered to him, no man can make the people happy altogether. And so that was a good answer. So anyway, that's at one type of the philosopher. Arsartre runs to Khrushchev, wants to persuade who fast he should do, then he runs to Fidel Castro, and does the same. How he has to uh, breed chickens, I think he sent a lot of chickens, <laughs> or eggs to Fidel Castro to learn him how to breed chickens. Never mind. Uh, that, was, that, that is what he did. So, uh, but there's another type of public uh, philosophers, that's the Spinoza type, who writes a book on, on, on politics, treaties on politics, um, and, and makes a case for a, for a democracy, for a republican policy and as acting as a citizen, can't also act as a citizen, uh, writing pamphlets, and in which went to, to persuade people how a de decent citizen is acting, and writing a book on perpetual peace, which of course was utopian, but was a great deed at that time to write this. So modern, modern uh, philosophers basically act like citizens, Mm -hmm. At least one citizen among many citizens. Mm -hmm. Of course, they are philosophers, so when they speak as citizens, they elaborate a little bit philosophically their own ideas. But they do not believe that they know it better. That's very important. They don't believe that they can give advices to others. Mm -hmm. They say they, can, they are able to express their views. They express their views, they express their views and their concerns and their problems, but they don't think that they are cleverer than others because they are philosophers. Because as citizens, they are not cleverer than others, then they are one citizen among others. And another thing, to be a good citizen is a different thing than to be a good person. I spoke about it yesterday with philosophy people here in uh, this university. It's different, but I cannot speak about this now. It's a, it's a different thing. But to be a good citizen, to be a good citizen nowadays, uh, you have to sign, in a way, symbolically, uh, the statement that all men are born free. And as the American Declaration of Independence expressed beautifully, we take this truth to be self-evident. And that's a beautiful expression, because they haven't said that this is the truth. They haven't mm. said that this is self-evident. He said, we are the ones who signed this statement. And this is very beautifully said. We, if you sign the statement that all men are born free, and doubt by creator, I don't repeat the text. If you sign this in your spirit, then you are, in a way, you commit yourself to act as a citizen. You commit yourself for acting as a citizen. If you don't, not everyone signs it. In the modern races will never sign his mm -hmm. statement because they believe that one is uh, born in a good race and other in a bad race. So, but those who sign this statement, they can become good citizens. But good citizens need to, need to sacrifice something. Mm -hmm. Every goodness co comes with certain sacrifices. You can sacrifice depending on where, how, where you are, how you are, who you are, what you can do. You can uh, sacrifice work, mm -hmm. time, money, mm -hmm. all the three, or two of them, or only one of them. <laughs> In, for the sake of the things, you belong to be important. Yeah, the boundaries of what you can do are bounded according to those cultural environments that you're talking about. I mean, it seems like the good citizen and the good person, you've said elsewhere, and it must have been what you talked about with the honor students yesterday, are p 
pillars on which some kind of ethical action can be constructed in a place with, where a foundation for ethical action isn't possible in the way it was for, if I understand you correctly, uh, in the cultural environments of a Spinoza or of a Kant. So I guess to, to bring this matter to a, a more concrete examples, could you talk about the different ways in which you've had to maneuver as an intellectual in these environments of, um, of Hungary under Stalinist influence than in uh, the liberal or very different liberal environments in Australia and the United States and then in Hungary since you've gone back? So you want me to return to my autobiographical memory. That's what you want. <laughs> so, all right. so I, I do suppose it. I'm prodding you to do so. Yeah, you know, that's what you, you want me to do. Obviously, when I was a child, I was a child, I was less than 15. I could not do anything politically in the Holocaust. The only thing I could do is to help to rescue friends and friends of my mother but I cannot do anything, and myself, of course, mm -hmm. and nothing, you could do nothing else. Now, after the liberation, I became a Zionist. That's also a kind of political activity. I remained a Zionist only for two years because I wanted to go to university, and I was, um, I was, I could not stay a Zionist. Ah, that is the, excuse me. Uh, it, I was expelled from the Zionist movement because they haven't accepted as a person could not study at the university. I wanted to study in the university. You never asked the question that I, why, what does it mean for me to be a woman, that you have not asked the question, but I answered this question without being asked. So <laughs> that is, I always wanted to be a scientist in my childhood. And of course, as a Jewish girl, there was no possibility to go to university. Mm -hmm. You could not dream about it. But then, after the liberation, I had the opportunity. I could not lose this opportunity. Mm -hmm. I was an opportunist in this way. I could have gone to go to a kibbutz and work, do agriculture work. As an opportunist, I used my opportunity. I wanted to be a scholar of a kind, so I choose university. And that was important for me because as a child, I read uh, the book by, by F. Curie, Madame Curie. And from this book, I learned a lot. Madame Curie was a great scientist. And the, although she was a great scientist, the greatest got two Nobel Prizes, etc. And they had a husband, they had two children. That you can have everything. Mm -hmm. You can have, be a wife, you have children, and a scholar, and everything. And even won the Nobel Prize. Unfortunately, there is no such a thing in philosophy. Never mind, it's not so important. <laughs> It's not so important. But you be a scholar, that was very important. That's very important. So, um, at, the, at the time of the communist regime, the Rakoshi regime, the first, you could not act as at all politically because there was such, such a great fear in the country. You could not make a move. The only thing of the opposition was to remain silent. This is, in a way, that Kostler described in his very yeah. important book, that, that the, his, his uh, neighbor told him that you, you should remain silent. The only thing you to do, remain silent. When come, came the Rakoshi period, of course, 56, there was a revolution, I was active in the revolution, but so were so many other people. We were very enthusiastic, we believed that we saved Hungary, the whole thing will be changed, that will be a kind of, um, hum, uh, socialism is the human face, as later on the Czechs expressed themselves. Mm -hmm. At that time, we haven't expressed ourselves that way. But socialism is the human face. That was wonderful. We will have a, a market society, but with communal ownership, yeah, with workers' councils, and so on and so forth. Uh, that was 56. It lasted 10 days. In the, uh, yeah, and that lasted 10 days. That in the cover period, slowly but very slowly, uh, uh, our group, which was called the Budapest School, but was a philosophical school, but we were in a way a marginal group, and we started a kind of activity which was not directly political, which was just a rather philosophical expressing ideas which contradicted the official philosophy of Marxism-Leninism. It's very fact that one does not want to exercise as philosopher Marxism-Leninism, which was the official doctrine mm -hmm. of, of, of communism, itself was suspect. 
So we became ourselves suspect. I was expelled from the party. Mm -hmm. Uh, that was not that important. In fact, well, what was important is the more and more to marginalize ourselves. Mm -hmm. The marginalize ourselves, which happened in two different periods, and the marginalization is not, an, uh, not a positive opposition standpoint. Mm -hmm. That we, we did only that we did not do, that we did not obey. But we did not disobey either. That's very interesting. I, cannot, I don't want to make heroes about ourselves. The situation changed after 68. Because mm -hmm. 68, there was two things happened. That was the new left, which I was extremely enthusiastic about the new left. On the one hand, and the activism of the new left. Mm -hmm. I, and, and on the other hand, was the Czech experience, the Prague uh, Spring. Mm -hmm. And in parallel was an economic reform in Hungary. Mm -hmm. It was a great hope that no synchronization between Czechoslovakia and Hungary, the situation will be changed. Now we became disappointed in this change as well. And only after this, after this, we came to the conclusion that the regime cannot be reformed. It must be changed, it cannot be reformed. That basically our activity could be called an oppositional activity. But that was only also very, very, uh, we, we could not cross the borders because very, there are very strict borders there. For example, they found a revolver in a library, and of course they found the revolver because they put the revolver yeah. there. It was not, uh, not a, a, an open and cut case that there will be no Lukács trial and we will not be involved. So it was a very uh, problematic age. But after 68, there was no more the danger of be, there is no more, there was no danger to be executed mm -hmm. after 68. There was no such a thing. And was there not even a danger for a longer uh, imprisonment, only for a short one. So the situation was less and less pressure. It uh, was a less and less pressure. Slowly, but surely, we came, uh, we arrived to um, active opposition. This active opposition happened uh, because of 68. Because the Czech, because our invasion of Hungary and invaded also Czechoslovakia in '68, and then it happened that we wrote a declaration to France press, and we protested against the invasion of uh, Hungarian and Soviet army into mm -hmm. Czechoslovakia. That was a political action. The political. <coughs> Opposition, Hungary started with this action because after 56 people were intimidated. That was the all, first open action against mm -hmm. the Hungarian government, and mm -hmm. it was the worst in their eye because we have not written a letter to Janos Kadar mm -hmm. uh, telling him that he was wrong. That could still be tolerated, then it would have meant that we have trust in the party, but we, went, we turned to a foreign press to a foreign country press, a mm -hmm. danger, an imperialist press, yeah? mm -hmm. France, France press, so if we made a declaration that the imperialist press to the enemy of Hungary. By the way, this is a little bit uh, uh, in a way imitated nowadays, this kind of argumentation. So that was dangerous, and then of course we, we um, as a conclusion, not now, but after the death of Lukács, we lost our jobs and we became politically unemployed. And because of this, we left, we applied for a possibility to work abroad, and it was later rather than sooner, we were let out to foreign countries, we, to Australia. But I repeat, this was different kind of political action than in a kind of liberal democracy, or even an illiberal democracy. Mm -hmm. It is our democracy now, it's illiberal, but if there, there's still a kind of possibility of public citizens' action, mm -hmm. which in a totalitarian country is very, very much limited. So, but you didn't regard your activity in the Budapest school, this intellectual work based on texts of the early Marx that weren't familiar to many people, to come up with a more humanistic socialism, <coughs> a more humanistic Marxism, what's called Western Marxism. You didn't regard that as political activity in the strict sense. Uh, it was political activity. Uh, the books themselves were political activity in indirect sense. 
But I wrote several articles, mm -hmm. several articles which were political activity mm -hmm. in a direct sense. Mm -hmm. But there was a writing, a political activity writing. And these writings mainly were published not in Hungary, mm -hmm. they were published outside Hungary. So basically I, I had a political activity at that time, but not inside Hungary, but outside Hungary. So went to Korcsola, met, uh, mm -hmm. was participating in the leftist discourse. Mm -hmm. So influenced German new leftists, mm -hmm. um, influenced American, uh, in Telos, mm -hmm. in America, new leftists. In, uh, influenced yes. new leftists in Paris, mm -hmm. yeah? But in Italy especially, yes. my book on Karl Ma Marx's theory of needs mm -hmm. had in one year six editions. It was very mm. great influence, but not in Hungary. So there was no space no, in that no, no, system in Hungary, for it Not to have within a totalitarian impact. state. Mm -hmm. that, uh, my political influence was basically broader and broader. Mm -hmm. It was um, and, uh, in the new left, as far as the political influence was outside Hungary. Mm -hmm. Inside Hungary, this book, for example, what, you, what I mentioned, mm -hmm. and you know this because the best known book, mm -hmm. perhaps this uh, uh, Theory of Needs in Marx mm -hmm. was never published in Hungary. Mm -hmm before the system changed, mm -hmm. never ever. <coughs> it was published in Hungarian in Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I, I shouldn't let pass the comment that you dropped about um, illiberal democracy, and I should ask what, in your view, is the difference between liberal and illiberal democracy in the sense that you mean it now, and how <coughs> is civic engagement different in the two? Models. But the expression illiberal democracy doesn't stem from me, but from our Prime Minister, Viktor Orban. Ah. <laughs> of the Fidesz he, party, he, of the uh, right wing Fidesz party. But it's a very correct definition power. of his own regime. Mm -hmm. uh, he said illiberal democracy, that was his expression. Mm -hmm. And another member of the, uh, of the today's government expressed uh, a week ago that we are living in a uh, democratic dictatorship, mm -hmm. which was also a very correct expression, mm -hmm. but what he meant by this. It's illiberal democracy, that means that uh, all institution of liberalism had been slowly eliminated. And the uh, freedom of the press was very much limited, very much limited. Uh, then the counter institutions had been eliminated, no checks and balances, mm -hmm. no division of power, concentration and centralization of power in one center, mm -hmm. basically a command obedience relationship. Mm -hmm. um, there is no legislative power in Hungary mm -hmm. nowadays mm -hmm. because the executive power decides what the law should be mm -hmm. and the government can say only yes and says only yes, mm -hmm. never says no, never can mm -hmm. say no. So there is no real, uh, there is no real legislative power. Mm -hmm. And of course, there are three very important uh, um, positions in Hungary, political position. The president of the state, the prime minister, and the president of the parliament, the prime minister Orban, and the two other positions are filled by the, his two best friends from his mm -hmm. youth. That mm -hmm. this means there is no division of power mm -hmm. in the highest, uh, uh, echelon of, of the political leadership either. Mm -hmm. At this you can see that uh, in the schools, all uh, schools had been nationalized, mm -hmm. that is the local councils have no schools on their own, all school directors are, um, ele uh, are basically nominated by the state, neither the parents nor the children any say who the director of the school will be, all the school, school books are basically edited and distributed mm -hmm. from the center, and the teacher cannot choose school books, neither mm -hmm. can the parents. Or, and the universities have lost their autonomy. Mm -hmm. Now there, there is a kind of person which is nominated by the state, which controls the pre, well, president called rector mm -hmm. in Hungary. That is basically all kind of freedoms are eliminated. Mm -hmm. that and is in the most recent elections, I should just you know, remind the audience that uh, just this year, Jobbik, a party even far to the right of Fidesz uh, that is explicitly anti-Semitic and, and, and fascist, um, has uh, as many as 20%, uh, uh, taken as much as 20% of the vote. No, no, no less than 20%. 19, uh, I think, yeah. Less than 20% of the votes in the national elections. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, 
Jo bek is an extreme right, this part is a racist mm -hmm. party, mm -hmm. and it is at the same time an oppositional party. Mm -hmm. So when you look at the voters of, uh, of Jo bek, half of them are active racist. Mm -hmm. The most racist party, besides perhaps the Greek one mm -hmm. in whole Europe. Yeah. But the other 50 percent are still ignorant, very poor people, there's a huge poverty in Hungary. Mm -hmm. A great amount of population is uh, on the po uh, poverty line. Uh, children, the children who have no hot meal in a mm -hmm. day or cannot eat anything or only once in a day. It's really uh, starving children, etc. I don't know what's going to happen in mm -hmm. the winter. It's a very, very poor country. And the difference between very poor, uh, rich and the very poor increases day by day. Mm -hmm. It is a very bad situation. So these very poor, if they go to the polls at all, they go for the Jobbik. They mm -hmm. vote the Jobbik mm -hmm. because he is, uh, has, uh, understands social demagogy. Mm -hmm. And he be, uh, of course, Fidesz also said that the banks and America and Brussels are the goals all the, of all yeah. the bad things, but Jopik is more demagogic, more demagogic, and catches somehow of these poorest persons who hate establishment. But all of these developments have taken place since you moved back uh, full time to Budapest, and you told me 2009, right? Uh, I returned to Budapest not full-time earlier after the system uh -huh. changed, but after uh, 2009 full-time I returned to mm -hmm. Budapest. It happened from uh, 2010. Mm -hmm. So your decision to move back and be an engaged intellectual in your home country was made in an environment that maybe had more promise and hope than the one in which you're currently living. And yet your engagement is very intense. You understand it very well. When I returned to Hungary, I, we, we uh, returned together with my husband then, partially returned to Hungary, not entirely. Then was the decision because we left Hungary because of political reasons. Since the system has changed, we can return to a, a country. Mm -hmm. So we did for a while, for at least for three months or four months. Uh, after 2009 entirely, I, my husband died beforehand, I returned entirely to, uh, to Budapest. Now, I returned uh, to a situation that was already very bad in 2009. There was still a socialist government which, which of basically formally honored all the liberal democratic institutions. But the opposition was so strong, and basically the opposition controlled the whole country. That is, the government was extremely weak, and the Fidesz already controlled the whole party because it was stronger than the governing party, which, which was a minority party anyway, minority government, and was very weak. So in 2009, it was bad enough. But I, when I returned, I never had a problem with returning. Everyone asked me in Hungary, why did you return? I said, because I have, to, I have something to do here. Because I, I feel that I have obligation. I have obligation to, uh, it is in fact on my duty to participate in public life as long as a kind of public life exists. Mm -hmm. if, if it's a little niche of the public life, I will act, be active in this little niche of the public life. And there is still a little possibility for, for public and engagement, citizen engagement, and I think, look, you always think that you do the right thing. So I also believe I do the right thing in doing this. <laughs> well, I, um, I, we're going to open up uh, for questions very soon. I wanted to ask you one last question before we do. And uh, you, you mentioned the horrible state of uh, uh, higher education in Hungary at this time due to illiberal centralization. And I wondered if you could talk about our own situation here in the United States and your view of what pressures there are on the university, on its role, its public role, on the relationship that we have with our students and in particular with students who are looking to change the world, to be engaged intellectuals in the way that you have been. I think the greatest problem in America is the stopping of upwards mobility. That mm -hmm. is, the universities are mostly very expensive and I think the danger is there that only those who are also intellectuals or only in positions uh, will have their children educated to occupy the same positions. It's very important in a country to have a strong upwards mobility. I think there is no upwards mobility in Europe either, 
don't mistake what I, you asked my question about America, not about Europe, there is no first mobility there either, but in America this is a very important thing because it was very high of first mobility in earlier times in the United States. Second, there is a great bureaucratization of universities. Again, not only an American thing. In whole, the whole world, universities became more and more bureaucratized. And far and far more money is spent for bureaucracy, 60% of the budget, university budget, roughly only 40% for faculty and students, which is a very, very bad thing, very bad development. Uh, third, uh, in certain universities, I don't think in most universities, but certain universities, people are not encouraged to think with their own mind. That is, the individual, individual development of the single student is less and less encouraged. That comes perhaps from objective reasons, there are mass universities. It was easy in Oxford and Cambridge that the tutor was interested in one or two students and invited mm -hmm. them for a whiskey in their room and they had lengthy discussions of philosophical or and theoretical problems. This is impossible. They have big classes, sometimes 100 students or classes. You cannot have they teach the individuals. So there are many problems that contradiction in universities because we want more and more uh, students to learn. There is this mass university, in spite of the absence of upmost mobility, there is mass university, we want to have an elite. In my view, and that's very strong view, um, democracy needs a cultural elite. Without a cultural elite, there is no democracy. It's a very bad conception that an elite contradicts democracy, only social elite contradicts democracy, only inherited social elite, but Cultural it is necessary for, for democracy. I think the cultural it, uh, it is not identical with intellectuals. It's not no. identical with academics. Cultural it is not identical, it is something else. They can be academics, of course they can be intellectual, but certain persons have a personality, a kind of personality play an important role in the understanding what good life is in a country. And it goes together, of course, with cultural production, certain kind of, uh, they can be writers, they can be philosophers, they can be engineers, they can be architects, et cetera, et cetera, that do, who do something important thing, and also as a person, uh, have, we, we, you express it in the role models, yeah? That's the correct expression. Do yes. I use the correct expression? That they are ready to be role models. And that's the most important thing in education as well, because if you ask me what is the most important edu in education, I think the teacher, uh, the teacher, a good professor, of course, is very good that he has, is a good scholar, but he needs, uh, needs to be a teacher who is engaged in, uh, with the students, who are interested in a student, not just in subject matter, not just about writing books, but uh, interested in the students. Unfortunately, it's difficult to be interested in the single students in mm -hmm. a mass university. That's also a very strong problem, mm -hmm. because every person is different, as we know. Or not only an autobiography is different, but we have different kinds of talents, different kinds of possibilities. And of course, there is a third problem. For all kinds of occupation, you need a uh, you need a passport, yeah? You need a, a university degree, that's mm -hmm. a passport. You can win this passport, university degree, you can do many things. Now basically, from all, almost every, you, every occupation you need this passport. In order to be a policeman, you need a degree. In order to be a cook, you need a degree. Every, and you need a key for everything, which does not need your learning, does not need what you learn, not only the piece of paper, what you give. It's a very bad development. I don't know how it can, can be changed. Very bad development that tertiary education is necessary for a normal survival in a society, which was not necessary previously, because you could learn a trade, you could go to a shop and learn how shopkeeping from, uh, from the master of the shop. And it was very simple. And you, there is no avenue, there is only one avenue with a, no, not every person's talents are alike. Certain person's talents would be very, would develop wonderfully uh, in a shop when at, at 12 or 13, uh, 
14, 15 years old, we could go to the shop and help out. You would become shopkeeper very soon. So I had a talent for this. Mm -hmm. But not everyone has a talent in, 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 in the bank, in a school, mm -hmm. at the university, listen to lectures. That's a special kind of talent. And anyway, that's a problem that we are born with a kind of genetic equipment. Mm -hmm. And we are thrown into a world, and it's not necessary that our genetic equipment and the conditions of the world will be fitted together. Normally, they are not entirely fitted. Mm -hmm. But we have the idea that it could be fitted, it should be fitted, more fitted than it is fitted now. Mm -hmm. And I think that this development of universities do not help us, the world of whoever I have in mind, that our genetic endowment could be fit with the requirement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And this, uh, we, uh, we feel unbehagen in their culture. Yeah, we, uh, uh, we, as uh, Freud has expressed, it, it, it is stronger, it becomes stronger. Mm -hmm. if, your, uh, if your best capacities cannot be developed in this cultural environment which we are thrown, because of certain situations which perhaps could be changed. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. And, you know, we've promised the Wallenberg Committee and the audience that we would leave time for questions. But first, I do want to thank you for your incredible and generous eloquence and frankness and spontaneity in the conversation just now. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, Scott. Thank you. We have, um, we have microphones set at these uh, strategic places in the audience and the lights are coming up so we'll be able to see you and some people will be filing out while we're organizing and I'll call on people and you can answer just from the seat or however you like. I, I go down and to uh, walk around. The people who Let's, perhaps we'll just wait questions. a second for the um, noise to subside as people file out. And then I do see a young man. Okay, oh, I go okay. down and to, because I have this piece in my hand. I can speak. Okay. Who is the first? Uh, so. Here. Go ahead. Young. Who speaks? You had of us. Okay. Hello. Huh. Let's start, let's start. Uh, look. Uh, it's a big, big queue. Wonderful. Hi. Okay. First of all, thank you so much for coming out. This was wonderful. Um, I heard about this last week and I'm glad that I made it out. Um, so something that I had found interesting that you had said um, was that uh, philosophy was the expression of our own lives and concepts. And um, I found that interesting because I think of philosophy a lot of times as, as something that um, challenges people to, like you said, look outside themselves and sometimes distance themselves from emotions and focus on logic and morality and things like that that can help us to answer questions, you know. And um, obviously, er, you had said that um, your experiences had influenced your philosophy and your working with ethics and things, and obviously those were very emotional experiences for you, so I suppose I was just curious what you thought about the intersection between emotions and then the practice of expressing yourself through philosophy. Now, a search of philosophy doesn't answer questions, but rather ask the questions. Mm -hmm. Or we can try to answer questions, but even if you ask the same questions, you always give different answers to the same questions. Now, philosophy is a... Do you understand me? <laughs> well, philosophy is not just a matter of logic. It's also a measure, matter of emotion. Whatever you do, you do it with emotion. I think that philosophers are in love with philosophy, and when they write philosophical books, they invite others to share their love. So we are not jealous of others who love philosophy, we want to invite them. They should join us in loving philosophy, loving thinking. Loving thinking because thinking and knowledge are different in kind. Of course, you start to think about things you already know but you do not think about what you already know. You think about what you do not yet know. And it's very important to think about what we don't yet know, or perhaps we'll never ever know. This is also something which excites us. It's also an emotional thing. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Uh, my question uh, has to do with uh, 
how you see Jewish continuity in Europe today. It's a question that many of us are dealing with. Uh, and uh, Hungary, particularly, we're thinking about places like France, uh, places like uh, Germany or, or Poland, but also uh, Hungary uh, today. So the question has to do with Jewish continuity in Europe, given the level of anti-Semitism uh, and uh, Islamic influence, a radical Islamic influence in Europe, etc. First, um, basically, all the European Jews had been exterminated. That we, if you uh, speak in historical terms, there were no real Jewish culture. There was no real culture, Jewish culture, left in Europe. Six million Jews had been killed by the Nazis. All the six million Jews were European. That is, this is, belongs to Europe. Very few Jews are living now in Europe, mostly in Hungary and in France, and now in Germany, coming from the old Soviet Union, but they are the only a very, uh, the number is very little. Now, whether the traditional Jewish culture can be continued in Europe, up to a degree, I think it can be, can be continued. I see the signs of it. In Hungary, for example, where there is anti-Semitism, but there are very important new Jewish communities and new Jewish institutions, cultural institutions included, three Jewish schools all in Budapest, Jewish, Jewish high schools also only in Budapest, a Jewish university in Budapest, and I think there are very good Jewish institutions also in France and also in Germany, and maybe also in other places. But there is anti-Semitism in whole Europe. Uh, in certain countries more and the others less. In Germany, the least, and the most anti-Semitic countries are perhaps Austria and France, because of the great number of Arabic influence. Hungary is also anti-Semitic, of course, but not uh, in a and not more anti-Semitic than the others. It was a statistic about, about uh, the, uh, the only difference between Hungary and the other countries that anti-Semitism <coughs> is divided according to party lines, which is atypical. It's not typical to France, not typical to, to Poland or, or other countries either, or not even in Austria, that it is divided according to party affiliation. The greatest anti-Semites are are fifty percent is Jobbik, I think thirty five percent is both uh, the, uh, uh, Fidesz and the Socialist Party, and the liberal and little leftist parties are less than five percent, but they practically not important. Uh, that's the, that's specificity in Hungarian anti semitism But I think there is a possible continuity, a rebirth of a kind of Jewish culture also in Europe. Um, I'd like to first thank you for giving this talk. Um, it really opened my eyes. I, I've heard, I've learned very much about the Holocaust in many of my other classes, but you gave me a very fresh new perspective on the Holocaust. And I guess my question was, um, you talked about in your lecture how that there's an increasing amount of anti-Semitism in Hungary. I, I've read that um, there was this rise of a new party in Greece called Golden Dawn, which is a very neo-Nazi and anti-Semitic party. And, and I've also read some some of the blogs about this rise of anti-Semitism in other European countries. What would you say is com contributing to the rise in anti of anti-Semitism across Europe, or is this just um, an illusion? Go this Golden Dawn is another anti-Semitic racist party. I think Jobbik and the Golden Dawn are the two more racist, extreme, rightist parties in whole Europe. These are the two of them. Yes, that's, that's for sure. What was the second question? I, I was um, just asking, what, what do you think is contributing to this? Yeah, what, well, look, uh, that's a good question, but you cannot, a uh, question we cannot answer. Because there is anti-Jewish feeling three Judaism exists. So it is in ancient time prior to Christianity was Judeophobia, Christianity was anti-Judaism, different in kind. Then in 19th century, that anti-Semitism in different forms, in social anti-Semitism. And now, basically, one of the main forms of anti-Semitism is the hatred of Israel. You cannot beat this. Yeah? 
So I think there will be anti-Semitism all the future, and the causes will be always different. Because the causes are just justification, rationalizations of a kind of feeling. So you cannot speak about objective causes because they are rationalizing certain kind of feelings. And uh, nowadays, anti-Israeli uh, propaganda has rationalized the same feeling which was rationalized by Jews are different than our, they don't eat or are together with our children, they don't marry our girls. Otherwise, they marry our girls, and that's why our boys cannot marry our girls. They are uh, communists, they are capitalists, they have the banks, they have the... Com they are, you can have all the arguments. The arguments are secondary. Then you will, they will always find arguments. Thank you. Good evening. Um, thank you very much for coming to the university. And we... We are all very grateful for your presence here and uh, your sharing of your, all of, of your insights and philosophies about what, to me, what it means to be a great person. And uh, I'm a student from China, and uh, since I've been here in the U.S., there's a, I've seen in the news every day about talks about the lack of freedom and lack of humanity in the current communist China. I'm wondering, uh, since you are a great scholar of Marxism, and I'm wondering what's your opinion on the current communist government in China and their reformation in their communist government and economy. It's very difficult. I was in China. In fact, I gave lectures in different lectures in China. I, and 12 books of mine are pub like published in China in Chinese language and sold in big, many exemplars because not too many people are there and they all read. Uh, well, at least three million people read books. Uh, that's okay. all <laughs> enough. Okay, but <coughs> my opinion about China, I think I am the least uh, qualified to speak about it. I think it's a, 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 a country, uh, people are extremely talented. It's, and there is such a thing as talented people, and there is a good thing as we can say tradition. That is, that is a tradition in China, very talented people, very clever people, and very centralized government, yeah? yes. emperor. Mm -hmm. So I think it is repeated somehow. Uh, very clever people, very great economic production, uh, very great development, very great intelligence, very, very great mathematicians and engineers, etc., and another emperor. Yeah? So I, this is so simply, yes. I think you would say the I agree, same. Yes. Okay, that was my impression about China when mm -hmm. I was there. I had very good uh, uh, discussions with students and a good discussion around in a tea house, around the table. Okay. Yes, you, uh, you know it well. And I love by, by Shanghai the best among all the places I was. Also, the food was the best in Shanghai. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was said Chinese food exists only in America, not in China. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I think it's, uh, I have to appreciate the two oldest cultures which are still living in this world are the Chinese and the Jewish. So, uh, what can we do about it? <laughs> thank you very much. Hi, and thank you. My name is Valeria, and I was born in Ukraine, so the idea of citizenship, I, I'm a naturalized citizen, and the idea of citizenship is really multidimensional for me. And you mentioned that we must all strive to be good citizens, or specifically you said that we must commit ourselves to act as citizens. What is your preferred way to act as a citizen? Of a where? Of a, sorry? Acting where? Acting in, anywhere as a citizen. Uh, anywhere, that's because that's different where yeah. you act. That's why so where do you want yeah. to speak? It's the different world. to sit in Ukraine today, yeah. in Hungary today, in America today, in Australia today. Where? There's this idea of citizenship to the world. So there are no citizens to the world because the world, uh, there is no city. The world constitutes of different kind of cultures, different kind of people very hostile against each other. Right. And you should know Europe is, a, a, for example, is a country of nation, na, nation states. And in Europe, there is a great problem that nation states have always the inclination to hate each other. For the time being, in the European Union, it is, it is a kind of peace between nations. We do not know how long it lasts. In, in the other part of the world, you see, 
religious wars. There are no nations that are different kind of religion if I had a war against each other. No, a citizen has a different kind of project in a nation state, in our old liberal democracy in America, Australia, or New Zealand, or whatever, entirely a different thing in places where there are religious wars. So I was, for example, in Iran, I was in, met students, met students in Isfahan. Now they had a different task. They wanted to fight, they were fighting for the minimum of human rights, of citizen rights, in a country <coughs> where the per capita execution is the greatest number in the whole world. We have a very, very difficult task for the students. So it's a different kind of uh, civil activity. Mm -hmm. Thank you. <coughs> Hi there, and thank you so much for spending this evening with us here tonight. My question actually also has to do with citizenship, and you said that a good citizen is someone who thinks for themselves, who can think on behalf of others, and who's able to question. But you also said that citizens think consistently if they're being good citizens. And when I think of consistency, I think of people who are rigid and closed-minded. So I'm wondering if you can explain what you meant by consistent thinking. Well, I haven't ex uh, exactly understood because uh, this is distorting the voice. Uh, okay. Tell me. Okay, you define citizenship, a good citizen is someone who thinks for themselves and can think on behalf of others. But you said that it's also somebody who thinks consistently. And when I think of consistent, I think of rigid and closed-minded. So what did you mean by consistent? Look, by consistency, that was, I can't say, it's consequent, because that's a German ex expression for, that's no better word than English, consistently. That is, it's very important to think consistently. It means if you are engaged in something, then you have to find out whether your uh, the conceptions fit to each other, whether you do not use a double standard in your own conception. Hmm? Because if you have a double standard, then your thinking is not consistent. You cannot say something in, case of, in one case and the opposite thing in another case because this is not consistent. Because A is A and A is not non-A, and A is A in everything but you say, and you use the same term in the same way in your whole way of thinking. When you speak about your grandmother, and you think a grandmother, that in the next, um, <laughs> next five minutes, you should not speak about the uh, word grandmother for your grandfather. Yeah? That's also consistency. <laughs> Thank you. I'm alumni from the university, but I also studied in uh, Yiddish-speaking schools in Brooklyn and Israel. I was curious if you thought that uh, there would be a possibility to reestablish some of the Hasidic centers in Hungary, say Satmir, Seagate, Bells, that have sizable followings today, to reestablish in Hungary as uh, maybe like the Native American indigenous nations within Europe say, return of Hasidim, creation of indigenous nation states within uh, Europe? Well, uh, European nation states are all nation states, and they are increasing in numbers because every pe people wants to be a nation state. The only counter uh, move was the uh, Scottish election, Scottish referendum, that was the uh, first blow against the nation state idea. So Europe is a nation state. In fact, uh, the problem of Israel was first formulated by Moses Hess, as you know, and his model was a nation state. He said that so that was Rome and Jerusalem, the title of his book, because the Italians created a nation state, the Jews can also create a nation state. They have great problems with nation state, with all of the nation state, but we have problems with all kinds of states. I mean, return of the land of the Hasidic lands of the, that still have large followings today to return their land in Hungary and allow them to return to their way of life as they existed Who, before Whose the land war. should be turn, returned to whom? Large Hasidic groups such as Satmar, Seagate, Bells, that have, still have tens of thousands of followers of the traditions from pre-war Europe uh, that are provided haven here in America. 
I don't exactly know what you are speaking about in Hungary. As you speak, if you speak about Jewish communities, they exist in great numbers. Also, Hasidic communities exist in Hungary. And in a way, they got back something that they had once upon a time. Uh, after a degree, there is no, they are not great in numbers. Uh, this is what you have in mind? A return of their land to allow them to return and reestablish their way of life in Europe on the land that was taken but from But I don't think war. that people have this kind of desire. Why you, from where should the people, from America, should they go back to Poland from which they came? I don't think that's a reliable conception. I don't think, I know so many Hungarians here. I don't think that who live here in America would like to go back to, the, to Hungary, for example, or from Israel. They would not like to go back to Hungary or to France. Rather, the opposite happens. Now this and France go to Israel. I think to establish like an Indian reservation type mm -hmm. indigenous nation within Europe. I, I would not like this idea. We have, we have time for one more question and then um, John Godfrey will close the event. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, and it's such an honor to be the last question. Yeah, Sorry, I'm the sorry. last is the most important. <laughs> you are my size. <laughs> Post-World War, World War II Germany is infamous for silencing and trying to just have a move on perspective after the Holocaust. Who do you think the most important artistic, literary, and philosophical voices are in lifting the silence in, pers in this era in German history? Uh, first of all, I think about Holocaust, about Auschwitz, uh, you cannot uh, create anything which would be more dramatic and they would express more than the word Auschwitz. So when Adorno said that after Auschwitz you cannot write poetry, he hasn't meant that you cannot write a verse. He meant only that you cannot write a verse, you cannot paint a painting, you cannot make music which would uh, give you some more, more, more meaning to what happened in the word Auschwitz. This is what he meant. I think in this respect, he was right. Thank you. Thank you. So on behalf of the Wallenberg Committee, I'd like to congratulate Agnes Heller and to thank her for this evening's lively conversation, and for her energetic engagement with students and faculty during her visit to the university. She is here tonight with her son, George Feher, who has accompanied Agnes from Budapest. And before we say good evening, there are others we must acknowledge. First, we want to thank Professor Scott Spector for his thoughtful participation. Also present this evening is Zachary Petroni, who last year became the first recipient of the university's Wallenberg Fellowship, which provides support for a graduating senior of exceptional promise to undertake anywhere in the world a year-long independent project that carries forward the commitment to service and the public good that Raoul Wallenberg embodied. This fellowship is supported by generous gifts from Bert Asquith, Michigan class of 1931, and by John and Lily Bossy. Finally, we want to thank our American Sign Language translators, Lindsay Weekend and Helen Boucher, for a wonderful job. Thank you for joining us, and good evening. <laughs>